instead of investing 196 billion in, in U.S. assistance, we we should have been sp uh, spending every day since the war broke out trying to negotiate a compromise uh, peace peace agreement. And this should be a bilateral. This should be an agreement that's uh, where the negotiations take place between the U.S. and Russia. Ukraine does not have to be involved in the negotiations because the Biden administration has made clear there uh, they can represent uh, Ukraine's interests very well. Uh, we would uh, negotiate the best deal possible uh, with Russia on behalf of Ukraine, and they'd be forced to accept it. You know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. This is a proxy war between NATO and Russia. The very fate of the world hangs in the balance. Yeah. And uh, and Zelensky is the primary obstacle. Now, I, I'm not saying Zelensky is a horrible person. Uh, I do think he's a, a bit of a dictator. He, you know, he's, he's crushed democracy in Ukraine. Um, but he's not a mass murderer. You know, he's not responsible, even though he, uh, I think Ukraine and NATO provoked the Russian invasion. Uh, you know, we have to unite in condemning the illegal aggression that Russia uh, did when they invaded Ukraine. But the fact is that uh, Putin's been much more, uh, you know, amenable to a, a near-term peace solution than Ukraine has uh, by orders of magnitude. And the Biden administration is stymied at uh, any peace negotiations at every turn. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking again with a longtime uh, friend of this show, uh, David Pine, who is a former U.S. Army Combat and Arms Headquarters staff. Uh, he was in charge of armaments cooperation with the former Soviet Union and other regions of the world. He currently serves as the Deputy Director of National Operations for the Task Force on National and Homeland Security. Uh, he's also one of the people on Ukraine's uh, notorious and infamous uh, kill list of uh, enemies of Ukraine. And if I get my information straight, it's the same list that also Daryana Dugina was on, who then was killed in Russia a year ago. Uh, and also Max Blumenthal and Tulsi Gabbard are on this list. Basically anyone in the in the US and worldwide who doesn't who intellectually doesn't agree with the current course of action finds themselves on that list. And I think you're still on there, right, David? So there's actually two two lists. There's the blacklist and the and the uh, and the and the kill list. So I'm not on the kill list. I'm on the blacklist. There's 35 uh, Americans that are supportive of peace uh, in Ukraine that are on Ukraine's uh, blacklist currently. Some of those Americans are also on the kill list. Thankfully, I'm not one of them. Okay. Okay. I'm glad. Uh, at least your security seems to be fine. Um, it's a. Uh very dramatic but in this context you recently reached out to me in order to share with me a proposal that one of the republican party candidates for for the presidency made uh, his name is uh, vivek ramaswamy uh, he formulated and published an a, a proposal for how to um, reach a a ceasefire or a peace agreement in Ukraine, and you were working with him on that. Could you maybe tell us something about Ramaswamy first? Because uh, to be honest, I haven't heard of him yet in the, in the race, because in the GOP, it's of course uh, uh, the Donald Trump who crowds out everybody else. So who's Ramaswamy? Uh, what are his chances of actually getting the nomination? And then tell us some of uh, about the work for this for this proposal. Yeah, so Vivek Ramaswamy is a 37-year-old uh, bio, former biotech CEO. Uh, he's uh, running strongly on an America First uh, conservative platform. That, of course, being a realist platform, a platform that supports peace overall uh, with uh, with Russia. Um, he's perhaps a little a little more uh, you know aggressive with China in terms of you know uh, posturing to uh, uh, to try to deter them from invading Taiwan. You know, obviously. I think we all want to avoid uh, a war. Uh, you know, reunification deal is is certainly uh, possible, though it's 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 hard to see how any U.S. leader could agree to that at, at this point. Uh, perhaps under duress uh, in the event of a you know a blockade threat. Uh, but uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, you know, he's he's very um, he's very inspiring. He's a very charismatic speaker. Um, he's risen in the polls. He started out near zero. I think he's about two and a half percent right now. He's been around the three percent range for uh, for some time. So he's moving up in the polls. He's a, he's an up and comer. Uh, obviously, he he lacks the name recognition of of Trump and DeSantis. Uh, but he's um, I, I really think he's gonna he's gonna soar. And, and where he's gonna excel is in the debates. He, um, you know, he is a tremendous uh, speaker. 
uh, I uh, campaigned with them uh, just last month in uh, in Kentucky, and uh, also visited his headquarters. And he's got a very he's got a very strong team, very committed team. Um, and uh, and you know, I was I was really excited to to advise him on on his most recent plan to uh, uh, to end the war in Ukraine, essentially end the Cold War with with Russia. You know, it's something that. Uh, you don't see any any other Americans really talk about. You know, Trump, of course, talks about ending the war in, in 24 hours, but he he he, do, he won't say how, uh, and maybe he doesn't know for sure. But I I think he, I think he knows enough to know that ending uh, ending aid to Ukraine is the only way to end the war. You know, Russia, of course, has been seeking peace uh, more, of course, on their terms or or compromise terms, whereas Ukraine has been much more absolutist. Uh, uh, Zelensky has said absolutely, you know, he's made made it against the law uh, in Ukraine for any Ukrainian government officials to even talk, negotiate, you know, even simply say, these are our terms, we're absolutists, we won't, you know, we won't, uh, this is where we're going to start, you know, at least at the, um, at the, at the level where, uh, you know, we, we regain all our pre-war territory that we controlled. And you know you get to keep part of the part of Donbass that that uh, where the Donetsk, Donetsk and uh, Luhansk People's Republics were uh, had the line of control, and then Crimea. So um, you know that we just need to really uh, have cooler heads prevail. Uh, we're in a situation that's uh, really more dangerous, not only for uh, the U.S. and Europe, but for uh, for the world and especially our U.S. allies. You know, um, allies of uh, of Russia and China certainly. Neutral states are much uh, less uh, might have much less to worry about. Uh, U.S. allies, on the other hand, um, you know, are put the kind of put put a uh, a target on their backs merely by being our allies in a situation where we're trying to escalate this proxy war with Russia and Ukraine. Yes, it is extremely dangerous. It is extremely ex uh, escalatory. Still, what's going on at the moment? What worries me most is that there's talk. It's not confirmed yet, but there's talk that Victoria Newland will be the new Under Secretary of State. If that happens, then God help us. But uh, because she's one of these main neocons who actually uh, pushed for this war ever since, since 2014. Um, but th the question that then people worldwide have is if there's a change in the White House, we don't we know there will there will be something changing in the White House in by a decision in 2024, uh, because nobody seriously believes that Joe Biden is going to make it through another four years, which from now on would be another five. We already see how he is struggling, right? But so there will be a change. That's pretty sure, uh, even if he uh, even if he wins another another term. But so Ram Ramaswamy, what is his and your proposal in order to get to the negotiating table, saying that um, uh, Zelensky? put out a decree making it illegal not only for himself, but for all the following presidents of Ukraine, although we now know that he's not intending to hold any election. So he's going to be in the seat for as long <laughs> as there's martial law. Uh, with, right. I mean, in, in, in the name of protecting democracy, <laughs> switching it yeah. off is, of course, very important. Yeah. But let's leave this aside because we all understand that this is pure rhetoric, like lies, pure good old propaganda but let's put that aside for re in realistic terms what is a realistic way to force negotiations so it's really it's really you know i mean i i really admire dr john mearsheimer you know our, our premier foreign policy realist theorist in, in the country here in america um but what do you you know he's very he's outstanding at, at uh demonstrating the problem and how we got here and and but he he doesn't have confidence in solutions, and I'm I'm a very solution based. Uh, Vivek Ramaswamy is very solution based. Uh, he's a grand strategic thinker. He's the only one in the presidential field that can think strategically, or at least has ex uh, expressed the ability to think strategically outside the box, which is what we need. And essentially, uh, you know, the, the solution is is very simple. It's uh, we need to cut off immediately, cut off all U.S. assistance to Ukraine, not only military. But economic until Ukraine implement, you know, agrees to and implements um, a armistice agreement with with Russia that would be permanent. They would uh, freeze the line of control. It'd be a Korean style ar uh, armistice agreement. So we would have peacekeepers deployed. We'd have a, a perhaps a four kilometer wide DMZ uh, that would have you know mines and various uh, you know fortifications, and it would be. Uh, this would stay in place uh, while peace negotiations continue for uh, what we would hope would be a permanent peace agreement. 
in which both sides would have to make uh, you know reciprocal concessions, much like Reagan did during the, to end the Cold War, uh, to bring about the the collapse of the Soviet Union in a peaceful manner. And uh, you know uh, what we need to do is we need to uh, essentially end the Cold War with Russia. We need to um, you know as part of this agreement we would we would agree to uh, to lift all sanctions against Russia. We would normalize uh, trade. And diplomatic relations with them. This idea that we 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 can't talk to Russia about Ukraine that the, you know, the Biden uh, administration's been uh, been having this uh, what I call a diplomatic temper tantrum for the last uh, sixteen months, uh, where they've only spoken to them about Ukraine. I think uh, at a high level for only ten minutes, literally, uh, you know, which is really worthless. We should we should instead of investing one hundred ninety six billion in, in U.S. assistance, we, we should have been sp uh, spending every day since the war broke out trying to negotiate a compromise uh, peace peace agreement. And this should be a bilateral. This should be an agreement that's uh, where the negotiations take place between the U.S. and Russia. Ukraine does not have to be involved in the negotiations because the Biden administration has made clear there uh, they can represent uh, Ukraine's interests very well. Uh, we would uh, negotiate the best deal possible uh, with Russia on behalf of Ukraine, and they'd be forced to accept it. You know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with saying that. This is a proxy war between NATO and Russia. The very fate of the world hangs in the balance, yeah. and uh, and Zelensky is the primary obstacle. Now, I, I'm not saying Zelensky is a horrible person. Uh, I do think he's a, a bit of a dictator. He, you know, he's he's crushed democracy in Ukraine. Um, but he's not a mass murderer. You know, he's not responsible, even though he, uh, I think Ukraine and NATO provoked the Russian invasion. Uh, you know, we have to unite in condemning the illegal aggression that Russia uh, did when they invaded Ukraine. But the fact is that uh, Putin's been much more, uh, you know, amenable to a, a near-term peace solution than Ukraine has uh, by orders of magnitude. And the Biden administration is stymied at uh, any peace negotiations at every turn. So, um yeah, it would include it would include uh, normalization of diplomatic and trade ties. It would include essentially a mutual uh, security agreement in which minimally uh, we would withdraw all U.S. troops um, and Western NATO troops from Eastern Europe, uh, reverting essentially to the uh, you know the pre-2016 uh, status quo in, in Europe, in which uh, you know uh, much of Eastern Europe was part of NATO for I think 17 years in the case of Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. And we never deployed a single uh, single soldier, U.S. soldier, uh, to Eastern Europe. So uh, you know that's not that's not rolling back NATO. We wouldn't roll back NATO by one inch. Uh, we wouldn't uh, recognize the annexations uh, by Russia of Ukrainian territory, but we we, we would recognize de facto Russian control. Uh, really, you know, we just have to realize that there's uh, zero chance that Ukraine can defeat Russia. Russia is, you know, overmatches them in every single area. Uh, militarily, economically, um, and they have, uh, you know, 8,000 more nuclear weapons than uh, than Ukraine has. Um, and the U.S. has proven, and every other country in the world has proven, that they're not willing to send any combat troops to uh, defend Ukraine, uh, perhaps a few advisors, you know, kind of Vietnam-style that we've deployed. There may, may be dozens of, of U.S. troops that have engaged in, uh, you know, at the front line uh, with Russian forces. But Essentially, uh, we're not willing to to do anything to uh, to overly attack Russia because uh, we know that will escalate to a nuclear war, uh, and it may escalate to a nuclear war with, without doing that. So, uh, yeah, Vivek, Vivek's plan is all about um, ending the war in Ukraine, but also uh, dividing the Sino-Russian alliance. And I, I know you and I uh, differ on you know the degree to which Russia and, uh, and China are are linked. Obviously, they have very extensive economic and military ties. Uh, it's an open debate as to whether they're true allies. Uh, they proclaimed this uh, no limits partnership in uh, February of 2022. Um, but the, the objective of this of this proposal is not only to end the Cold War with Russia, uh, end the uh, end the war in Ukraine, but it's also to uh, to split the Sino-Russian alliance. Perhaps not with uh, by ending their uh, alliance treaties or agreements, uh, such as the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization. A treaty, but uh, minimally to just to neutralize their alliance uh, with with China, and the way they, that we would do that is essentially by having friendly relations with them, by uh, uh, allowing uh, large scale Western investment in Russia. You know, a lot of the things recognizing, at least in a de facto way, a, a Russian sphere of influence in Central Asia, for example. 
uh, an area which uh, you know the, the U.S. has no strategic interests whatsoever that China is actually beginning to infringe on. So uh, I think this is a very uh, it's a very forward looking strategy, uh, and I think it's one that's uh, far better than uh, what anyone else has proposed. And I think the good news is, uh, you know, when Vivek or uh, or you know whoever the Republican nominee is, it's going to be a pro peace candidate uh, with Russia. So that it, one that's uh, absolutely committed to ending uh, the war with Ukraine by cutting off U uh, Ukrainian assistance yeah. until they implement a, an armistice agreement. Yeah. Uh, it's the um, despite I mean whether or not I agree with the assessment of if Russia and you uh, and uh, China are in an alliance I don't think they are but it doesn't even matter that much the thing that no, interests me is what will be believed by the U.S. security establishment and by the U.S. people who then have to vote for a um, for a commander in chief next year right so what do they believe and so the the thing is what i see in the united states is there's two pro peace factions pro peace with ukraine the one faction is the pro peace in general no war stop the endless wars of the united states we should not be messing with the world we should withdraw our troops and care about ourselves maybe our hemisphere you know let's talk we can talk about the monroe doctrine in south america but you know what what yeah. do we have to do in in the pacific and in in uh, Eastern Europe, I mean, seriously, that's one of the peace faction. But then the other peace faction is that we need peace in Ukraine in order to have more capacity to do war with China. <laughs> so is Raman Suwami part of the first or part of the second? I would say that he's a little bit in between. Um, he's certainly, I wouldn't say he's a hawk on China, but he's not a dove either. So he's not, um, he recognizes the China threat as I do. Um, I think he wants peaceful coexistence with China. I think he's all about uh, deterring China and ensure, to help to ensuring peace. Um, you know, I think he's he's all about doing whatever we can. Uh, you know, diplomatically, economically, militarily, uh, to deter uh, a Chinese invasion of of, uh, of Taiwan. Um, but I also think he's realistic. I think that if uh, if such an invasion were to occur, I think uh, he would. Um, you know, I, th I think he would he would really consider what what is in the strategic interest of the United States, whether it's worth um, risking the lives of 275 million Americans in our nuclear war with China, uh, you know, to defend a country the size of Moldova, which admittedly is does have, you know, strategic interest for the United States in terms of the advanced semiconductor industry and preventing that from falling in Chinese hands. Uh, but, uh, you know, realistically, you know, do we really want to risk um, you know, a, a full-scale nuclear war with China, if it at all can be avoided. And I think that's where spheres of influence come in. You know, this, this proposal really doesn't, uh, to some extent, it kind of, you know, it kind of does establish kind of a de facto sphere of influence uh, in Europe in the sense that it uh, almost creates um, what I would say is a little bit of a buffer region, uh, you know, in terms of Eastern Europe and Ukraine being uh, buffer states between the, the U.S. and Western NATO militaries and Russian troops. Russian troops, of course, would have to withdraw from Belarus. Uh, they have to withdraw their nuclear weapons from Belarus as well under this agreement uh, in order for us to do the same uh, in withdrawing our troops from Eastern Europe. Uh, but I think that's really that's really more where we need to go um, and, and where his strategy, I think, uh, aims to aims to achieve as well. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, if, if funnily enough, I do interpret the deployment of U.S. New, uh, tactical nuclear weapons to uh, Belarus as actually an uh, uh, another proposal of Russia to actually negotiate, because this is something that they can withdraw from Belarus without strategically or tactically infringing upon their own interests. The, the, this, these weapons in Belarus make no sense, especially because they are still under Russian control. Uh, there's nothing that you can bomb um, through nuclear weapons from Belarus that you can't do from Russia. This is this is sheer, uh, to me, I interpret this as uh, 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 putting up um, a chip for negotiation, you know, and actually making it quite clear because I mean, what do you need this for? And we have seen at this at this point that um, you can fight a conventional war 
again, nation, nation against nation without it going nuclear, although this is a very, very risky gamble. And the Russians at the moment are publishing uh, pieces, you know, of, of advisors of Putin that say we need to make the West afraid again of our weapons. The problem is that they are not afraid of us using nuclear weapons. They believe we will never do it. Therefore, they do whatever they whatever they want, uh, escalating um, conventionally, however they want. And they are afraid of the next step of escalation, the F um, the, the the jet fighters that could maybe depart from Russia from Romania and then and then fly attacks in uh, in U in Ukraine. That would be one. The other one would be, of course, uh, in this uh, NATO summit that's coming up to decide that they will start sending maybe volunteer troops from NATO countries, gather them and send them to Ukraine because Ukraine is running out of men, right? So get some Eastern Europeans who are dumb enough uh, to actually send people. And, 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 you know, as always, you just, you gather a few poor people, you promise them tens of thousands of dollars a month, and then they are willing to go and throw away their lives. That's not that difficult to do, but that would be another escalation. Now, the, um, the, the, the question is who in the United States would be willing to actually start seriously uh, nego negotiating uh, this uh, downward because the spiral is still is still going up and as long as the neocons are in power i do believe they they will continue do you think that some somebody like ramaswamy would be able to kick them out like let's say Nick, victoria newland becomes the new under secretary of state ramaswamy becomes president could he kick her out he, uh, he would replace you know it's it's the tradition uh in uh in the us that we with every new administration uh, they replace all the high level uh personnel uh you know everyone essentially but the director of the fbi that's you know it's kind of the only one the only position that is supposed to be non-political so uh yeah i can guarantee you that victoria newland would be would be out under a ramaswamy administration uh you know this is a guy who's fearless he's he's a uh he really has nothing to lose. He's he's fearless. He he wants he's committed to putting America first, to being uh you know realist on foreign policy, uh, to having peace with Russia, ending the war in Ukraine, uh, rebuilding Ukraine, you know through uh, peaceful means, economic means, uh, saving Ukrainian lives, saving some Russian lives in the process as well, and perhaps the lives of millions of Americans and Europeans that would die in a direct war, uh, direct conflict with uh, with the Russian Federation, but. Um, you know, kind of the the centerpiece of the of his whole peace plan is essentially to make Russia a strategic partner. You know, perhaps uh, uh, you know I, I want to say friend, but I, maybe that's maybe that's going too far. A strategic partner that we would we would work with. Uh, you know, we would have full diplomatic and, and economic uh, relations with. Uh, most favored nation trade status would be restored uh, that we took away at the, at the onset of the Russian invasion. We'd have a free trade agreement with the Russian Federation. We'd have Western investment. Uh, you know, we would we would stay out of Central Asia. We would keep our troops out of Eastern Europe and we would essentially accept Russia. You know, this is what essentially what Russia has always wanted since the yeah. fall of the Soviet Union. They've wanted to be part almost part of the West. Essentially, they've wanted uh, a place, you know, a, a place at the table. They've, they've wanted uh, to go beyond the, the uh, joint uh, Russia NATO Council and actually be accepted as as an equal player, uh, a great power, obviously. Uh, within the economic and security infrastructure of Europe, and that's been the solution all along. If we, I mean, if we had invaded invited Russia into NATO in the 1990s, it would have become a much less hostile, uh, conflict-centered uh, uh, institution, and it could have helped establish world peace uh, in in Europe and and uh, Western Asia. So uh, yeah. that's kind of, I think, the direction that Vivek would like to take us to. That the thing that most people don't understand is that Russia was cooperating in the 1990s very closely, especially on the Beres Yeltsin. Russia was part of NATO's Partnership for Peace program, which is kind of this open for like whatever you want it to be cooperation that actually right. became a springboard for like a lot of states to join NATO, including Finland and Sweden. Um, and Russia was part of that. Russia participated in 1996. They really and they were asking three times, can we can we join NATO? And three times the answer was like, no, I mean, we don't want to go that far. We still want to be able to point our missiles toward Moscow, right? We don't want to change the direction, even though we're saying they are to Tehran, but we all know it's it's going to Moscow. And so the thing is, the only problem I have with that logic that you were presenting is that why would Russia believe it? Russia tried for 25 years to actually integrate into this institution, was kept out and now took the decision or, or learned, just like China, actually, they understood 
this is not going to happen. They will never make us part of it. And if that's not going to happen, if we cannot have a cooperative security relationship, the only thing that's left is a balancing one, which means we need to be the counterpart to, to them. And I, I see them as executing that at the moment. Um, okay, strategic balance, fine, if we can if we can have an agreement. So why would Russia believe it, even if the 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 a new president was saying hey we want cooperative relationship because we have seen that script before we have seen it before the 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 promise not an inch to the east right <laughs> so the russians ha can like legitimately point to a lot of very very broken promises so why would they believe a new promise because we have to prove it by our actions uh a ramaswamy administration would implement uh, a deal similar to what Russia offered, uh, you know, the, really the mutual security agreement that they've been trying, that Putin has been offering since 2007 and uh, last offered in, in uh, of course, in December of 2021, before it was rejected in January of last year by the Biden administration. Um, and that that is essentially uh, part of what I spelled out. And that is, uh, you know, uh, a joint withdrawal from Eastern Europe of, uh, you know, Western and, and Russian military forces that would include Belarus, of course, and uh, any areas of Ukraine uh, outside of a peace agreement. Uh, you know, some nuclear uh, kind of pullbacks, essentially, uh, a new, a Russian nuclear pullback from uh, from Belarus. Uh, you know, we would pledge, obviously, to, to not having nuclear conventional forces in Eastern Europe. Uh, we could we could sign uh, an agreement where we agree to keep all of our conventional military forces, be it land, air, or sea. Uh, outside of a 200 kilometer limit um, from uh, Russia's borders. And that would apply to the US as well. Of course, uh, you know, Russia couldn't deploy anything uh, within that limit of, of uh, the US as well. So there's, there's all kinds of, um, you know, and then of course, uh, you know, there's perhaps arms control, uh, you know, deals that we can renew. Uh, I know Vivek talks about that in, in this proposal as well. So there's a lot of different mutual kind of mutual assurance reassurance uh, agreements that we can do with Russia, many of which we haven't done before. But I think that would which, uh, you know, simply by uh, having an initiative to, you know, to them uh, proactively uh, to uh, to to get get these agreements signed, uh, I think they would very quickly, you know, under a new president, you know, a new president that's uh, very different, almost a polar opposite from Joe Biden, who seems to want war with uh, Russia and China simultaneously. Um, you know, I think it would really reassure them. And uh, yeah, it's going to take actions, obviously, to to prove that we'll keep our agreements. Obviously, Russia has been terrible in keeping their arms control agreements um, with us. And uh, we've been terrible at keeping almost all, all of our other agreements with, with them. We've kept all our arms control agreements, essentially, very strictly, but then, as you mentioned, uh, we violate everything else in terms of you know expanding NATO eastward and and refusing to have a guarantee that Ukraine would never join uh, NATO, which would have entirely, I believe, uh, I think Vivek probably believes as well, would have entirely averted uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, in the first place. Um, one problem that we have is that the neocons who are driving this in the in the US don't only sit in the in the executive or in in the administration we have them in in uh, congress too right so we've recently seen uh, Lindsey Graham introduce a bill that would basically automatically uh, oblige the the white house to trigger article 5 if any kind of nuclear incident happened in ukraine um made by russia um can you talk about this i mean this this is another escalation so would these people the ones in in congress which still do hold like a, a lot of power over what's happening in the executive. Uh, could they be the spoilers? Would they be the spoilers, or do you think they they would let it go? Well, I mean, there's certainly a possibility of that you know, if we were to, uh, for example, Obama signed agreements, uh, an agreement with um, with uh, with Iran that he didn't didn't call it a treaty, and so it wasn't didn't have to be approved as such by the Senate. Uh, but there certainly could be pushback if we, you know, if we called, uh, you know, any of this like a peace treaty with Russia, a peace treaty, which I, we may not have to really, because it wouldn't essentially be a peace treaty, at least in, uh, with regards to Ukraine. And plus the fact that we're not a direct uh, participant to the war. Um, but that, yeah, that's certainly a risk. Uh, I mean, Lindsey Graham, I mean, he's always a warm honor. 
Um, he, he doesn't want nuclear war. Uh, at least he, he says he doesn't want nuclear war with Russia, but um, a lot of the actions he's proposed uh, would uh, essentially create that. Obviously, if uh, you know, I believe that if Russia were to use Ukraine, uh, use a nuclear weapon against Ukraine, they would do so in a, as a nuclear demonstration attack. They wouldn't. It would be essentially an airburst over a, a large city, perhaps key, but it would be a low yield weapon uh, that would have uh, kill almost no one with direct blast effects. Maybe no one at all, uh, perhaps used against, uh, you know, a Ukrainian brigade to blow a hole in their line, something something of that nature. Um, that would not rise to the level. I mean, Ukraine, we have no security agreements with Ukraine. There's nothing that in any way obligates us to provide any security at all, at all to Ukraine. Um, and so uh, I can essentially guarantee that even, even Joe Biden wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't, um, use nuclear weapons in response to that. And I think the chances of him uh, responding with a, a direct military attack against Russia in response to a very limited uh, and calculated, uh, you know, nuclear demonstration attack against Ukraine would be uh, quite minimal. Uh, but Lindsey Graham essentially wants to make it, you know, U.S. law so that even if even if there was a, a nuclear detonation over a city, a Ukrainian city that, that caused no deaths, you know, with blast effects, um, that he would want to uh, essentially start a war with with Russia by, you know, invoking Article Five. Now, as I write in my one of my latest articles on on my uh, Real War newsletter at tpyna.substack.com, well, there's a big misunderstanding of Article Five. Article Five does not obligate us to go to war yeah. if uh, one of one of the NATO member states are invaded. It, it obliges us to provide security assistance, but it leaves it deliberately leaves vague what security assistance that could be. Now. That could be weapons. Uh, it does not necessarily need to be troops. So we could provide arms, you know, defensive armaments uh, to a, a, a NATO nation under attack without actually going to war against Russia, for example, if they were uh, to invade or attack a NATO member state. Actually, everything that is happening at the moment by NATO states to Ukraine is basically Article 5. Uh, all of these things, and I really encourage people to read Article 5, it really doesn't say that you automatically have to go and send troops and go to war. It doesn't say that. It just says have to do everything possible, including military uh, uh, options to support. That's all it says. It's actually right. extremely weak in terms of a legal clause. <laughs> yeah. uh, it is. It's very. It's much weaker than what we had in the League of Nations, you know, before the before the Second World War. That was a very, very strong uh, clause. The, the NATO is actually, is actually uh, clause is, is much weaker. Um, the, the, the ridiculous thing at the moment is that if we actually think about actually going into the nuclear realm and we can see the Russians think about it and we can see the Americans thinking about it, the, the horrible thing we need to remember here is that the way that the nuclear, as the nuclear uh, ladder starts is with tactical nuclear weapons for military purposes the russians shooting a tactical nuke at the at the uh, positions of, of of the ukrainians and then maybe nato shooting a tactical nuke at the positions of the uh of the russians inside ukraine which would mean we will start by nuking ukraine both sides will be nuking ukraine and eastern ukraine from the ukrainian side and uh, or nato side and and the other one and ukraine is exactly in the position that germany was in during the cold war where at a limited nuclear exchange would mean the destruction of germany of both Germanys, right? It would mean, and limited nuclear exchange would mean the utter complete destruction of, of Ukraine, probably large parts of it, because this will continue inside Ukraine. Um, do you think the Ukrainians are crazy enough to even say yes to that one? I mean, that's the point where even the ultra-nationalists in Kiev, uh, the, the puppet masters of, of, of Mr. Um, Zelensky, should say, wait a second, well, I mean, I think that Zelensky has been clearly has been agitating for. Uh, I mean, he's talked about uh, encouraged NATO to conduct preemptive strikes against uh, you know Russian nuclear uh, nuclear bases, uh, nuclear missile bases. I mean, he's actually attacked Russian nuclear bases uh, both in Sev uh, Sevastopol, where there's uh, you know we ha they have uh, uh, you know Russian nuclear armed ships and perhaps storage facilities. Uh, he's attacked uh, Russian bomber bases within uh, within Russia proper, deep inside Russia, uh, perhaps damaging or destroying um, at least two nu uh, Russian nuclear bombers that we know of. Uh, that you know, uh, and the power may not, likely didn't have nuclear weapons at the at the time that they were uh, destroyed or or damaged severely damaged. But 
Um, you know, it's that's that's a very um, you know provocative yeah. provocative attack, and and uh, Russia could presume accurately that uh, the U.S. assisted in some way, even if only in terms of intelligence and whatnot. Even if whether we did or not, I mean, we've been doing that. Uh, across, I mean, we destroyed Nord Stream. Um, the Ukraine destroyed the uh, Kavaka Kavaka Bridge, uh, which was a kind of. I mean, those are two different humanitarian disasters. One was an environmental disaster, which is the, the greatest we've ever seen, uh, for by an administration that claims to support the environment, support climate. You know, that's climate how you, that's, and, that's how you know it's not real. That's how you know it's exactly. not real. It's uh, every anything anything that that doesn't hold up in times of war is not real. So we know that nuclear, right. nuclear mutual assured destruction, the fear of that is real. We know that right. now. We know that the whole uh, environmentalism is not because it's basic, it's a fig leaf for other, for other things. And we've also seen, by the way, um, <laughs> you know, that we still don't know who attacked the Saporizhia nuclear plant. I mean, um, we don't know <laughs> means, oh, it was the Ukrainians and it was the West, right? So right. We, so right. maybe they're they're willing to do that. And actually, there is a fear in Russia that that uh, there would be another attack, you know, that then actually gets the, uh, destroys the power plant and leaks radiation, in the, which then in the West will be spun as the Russians blew up again their own the infrastructure that they control uh, in order to be evil. Uh, and you can only fight evil with e with evil. Therefore, now we nuke them, or now we go we go all in. That's a real fear, and I think that fear that fear is is uh, is justified. Let me just ask one more thing. Um, on the other hand, we've also had senators like Rand Paul suggesting that Congress should take back uh, the power to make war because he's really afraid that the White House is abusing that. Can you explain quickly, like? Um, what historically is the power to make war? Um, which branch is it invested in, and why is it that it's 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 basically now with the executive? Under the Constitution, it's very clear that uh, the power to make war uh, rests in in Congress. Uh, there's kind of been um, essentially that the war monitors, so the neocons, would argue that uh, it just says that Congress has the power to declare war and not make war. But essentially, what the founders what the founders of our country uh, believed is that declare essentially meant make war. So essentially the, the commander in chief was only the commander in chief of the armed forces at war once war had been declared. So that's that's really the, you know, the strict constitutionalist view that, uh, that my Senator Mike Lee uh, and then Rand Paul and, and many others in the America First conservative uh, Republican movement in Congress are, have been advocating. Uh, but unfortunately we have uh, essentially, uh, we had a war powers resolution which Ironically, you know, neoconservatives oppose as being too constrictive. That essentially allows the president to uh, to wage to, uh, to make and wage war uh, for up to ninety days without Congress being able to to rein them in. And so, uh, what this I think what this resolution is trying to do is it's trying to to pull those powers back so the president doesn't have a, a three month uh, essentially nuclear war capability. Uh, where they can wage any war, no matter how drastic, without uh, congressional interference, uh, before Congress gets to uh, you know to review uh, all that's going on and, and perhaps veto and countermand uh, you know further military action. So I, I really welcome it. Uh, you know I wish more people supported. It. You know in the old days when I grew up in the 80s, uh, you know the the, uh, the anti-war strain ran very strong in the, in the Democrat Party. There were a lot of principled classical liberals. Uh, that believed in such things as peace and peaceful coexistence and had anti-war demonstrations. And now it seems, you know, the, the bulk of the of the, the far left is on uh, the pro-war side. And that's really unfortunate. There are some fa uh, factions of classical liberals that, uh, you know, do oppose uh, the Bi Biden's war in Ukraine and want to end that. They want peace with Russia. They don't want nuclear war. And of course, uh, you know, myself and others uh, on the conservative side are very happy and, and uh, willing to work with them uh, in the interest of a grand coalition for peace, uh, both in the U.S. and all uh, left right factions across the world to bring an end to this madness and uh, and end this war in Ukraine and end the immediate threat of, of nuclear escalation between Russia and, and NATO. I'm glad to hear that because the only thing that can pull us out of this is some form of political coalition in the 
uh, in the West that will counteract these forces, because I agree with you. The Russians have said time and again, we need to sit down and talk about this. This is not sustainable. Stop it. Stop it. Uh, until they, they said, OK, we need to force you. And the Ukrainians are the are the sacrificial lamb on that on that altar from both sides, from both sides. That's also how we know that both of them basically they don't both of them don't care about human lives. But we need a coalition in the West uh, in order to bring us back to ra- to uh, realist thinking to say like, okay, there is a realist solution to this. It just rounds counter to the argument that it's good against evil and either we win or the world is lost, uh, yeah. which is which is always the, the, the mentality of the of the warmongers. So I hope you're right and that we get that um, uh, that coalition, especially in the in the US. I just don't know because the the onslaught, the media onslaught is still so hugely ideological. Yeah, you know, we've really forgot the the old Cold War, uh, the Cold War rules of dealing with Russia. You know, during during the Reagan administration, he he understood that very well. He never tried to liberate Eastern Germany militarily. Uh, he did, you know, he he did it in a peaceful way and said, you know, uh, bring this wall down. Uh, but he never he never intended to uh, you know to expand NATO eastward. He never it, or to infringe on the on the Soviet sphere of influence, other than to try to liberate uh, those the captive nations peacefully. And that's you know that's the kind of way I mean look what it look what it accomplished I mean um, he uh, I think uh, Russia was convinced the Soviets were convinced that they could peacefully bring down the Soviet Union and uh, it, they they trusted us they trusted us yeah. not to take advantage of them and we did exactly that over a period of uh, of a couple of decades and you know presence of both parties yeah uh, and that's that was a disaster it's proven a disaster yeah. you know because there wouldn't be a war in Ukraine right now yeah. if, if we hadn't done that. I must say, though, in the defense of the United States, the people who negotiated the end of the Cold War, Jack Matlock and people of his of his of his standing and, and you know, the, the grand um, uh, the long telegram. Um, um, George Kennan, George Kennan, th- right. these people they were extremely sincere and they were very realistic and they held out a hand of friendship and Gorbachev took that hand and Jack Matlock never gets tired of saying the Cold War ended in 1989 when both sides decided we'll end it and the collapse of the Soviet Union happened two years later for related but different reasons, nationalistic reasons inside uh, Russia mainly. And this is something very important to remember. And the Russians have a history, a hundred year, hundreds of years of history of going for realistic solutions. The Russians are the reason why Switzerland is neutral today, because in Vienna, they were the ones who said, let's believe the Swiss can be neutral and, and support that, that. The Russians are the reasons the Austrians became neutral because they said, no, we believe that they will do a buffer state. The Russians actually trust other powers when you negotiate with them. So uh, maybe a way to, to negotiate is to just say, like, hey, this time we mean it and then prove it with action. Well, I think you've been a real champion of that uh, with your neutrality organization in terms of, you know, um, kind of trumpeting the idea that, you know, buffer states, you know, really aren't, you know, we're not talking about a colony. We're not talking about like a satellite. We're talking about a neutral, a truly neutral state, a buffer between uh, the two sides. And that, you know, that applies very well geographically with regards to Russia and NATO. It's much more difficult with regards to, to China. And they 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 proposed it for Ukraine, and we know it's the Ukrainians who walked away because because the NATO said walk away. We know that Putin actually showed the documents that the Ukrainians had already signed. It was it was a neutrality. It was there. It was already basically agreed upon. And just the other thing, it's also in place with Mongolia. Russia and China are both quite happy to have a mutant a neutral Mongolia between them because you know historically we know that the current the current flirty flirt between the two is not going to last forever it's going to go down again that's absolutely clear it's going to take 20 30 years but the, both of these states are smart enough because they understand that you know history didn't start yesterday it started earlier and there are some cyclical movements and they're very happy with buffer states the only one at the moment who's really unhappy with buffer states and who tries to undermine them constantly and persistently is the transatlantic alliance they hate these buffer states and we would have another buffer state if it wasn't for them actually ukraine would never have gone to this place would have remained a buffer state in 2014 had it not been for this maidan business um so my question is how do we how do we sell the idea of buffer states to the neocons or to to the transatlanticists 
you know, I, I mean, I think they're they're almost a lost cause. The Atlanticists and the neocons, um, the only way that they're going to change, I'm, I fear, is uh, from some kind of disaster. I mean, if if uh, if, if there was a, a Russian nuclear use in in Ukraine that you know was over a city but didn't ca cause a lot of casualties, I think that would be a wake up call to them, and that would be an awful thing. But it would be a wake up call uh, of the of the type that. Uh, they would need to shake themselves out of the spell of, of ide liberal idealis idealism and liberal hegemony and, and um, just not understanding the needs of Ukraine. I mean, the needs of Ukraine are for peace, for reconstruction, for, uh, you know, there's no realistic way we can liberate the last 12% uh, of pre-war controlled uh, Ukrainian territory. They've been annexed. The Ukrainian counteroffensive is failing badly. And so uh, the, the only way this war ends is, I mean, just as it as it would have been last year, if we'd ended it in in March with uh, the tentative peace agreement that that Putin uh, held at uh, at his meeting with the the, uh, the African Union, is through a negotiated peace agreement. And uh, unfortunately, the terms that Russia were offering uh, in uh, in March of 2022, uh, 2022, those those terms are gone. I mean, it's never yes. going to be that good. Those were good terms. Those were reasonable terms. Uh, in terms of what the best that Ukraine could hope for. And now it's the best terms are essentially a ceasefire and armistice agreement, uh, in which 88% of Ukraine's uh, pre war controlled territory is independent and secure and prosperous, rebuilding. Uh, the US could have the same kind of guarantee we had for uh, in the Austrian state treaty, in which we, we did essentially militarily guarantee Austria we could do the same for Ukraine. Uh, but only after uh, only with the deal that Russia finds acceptable, because obviously if if, uh, if we were to, to demand and force them, which we have no way of doing uh, to give most or all of their territory back that they they've annexed, they would come back again. And and if we were to, to at any point in our in the future, if we were to actually um, have Ukraine join NATO, they would invade it automatically, regardless of. That's their red line. That's been their red line all along. And that's why, uh, you know, this this whole facade, you know, Ukraine is never going to qualify for NATO membership. And the only, the only possible way they could is with the peace treaty with Russia, because um, one of the requirements for NATO membership is no foreign troops occupying your territory, no territory in dispute, um, all that kind of stuff that uh, they could only realize with, a, uh, you know, with at least an armistice agreement uh, along this nature. Yeah, yeah, you need it. You need Makes it. proposed. Um, I'm I'm afraid that of course you know the the neocons will escalate in another uh, on on their side and they will push towards oh let's forget about no no troops this is just a convention it doesn't say so in the treaty so uh, let's just uh, let's just put it aside and make them an ally anyhow and the the, the very second Ukraine is it would become something like like a member or, um, direct or extended uh, Zelensky could uh, would would try to uh, to activate Article Five right this is this is um, I'm pretty sure there's people who would want that because they want a, a, a all out confrontation and us who don't want yeah. that who would like people to live they um they will try to find off ramps in order to to de-escalate but these off ramps are constantly being burned you know the bridges that you that you burn down yeah. um the thing that i believe at the moment that the russians are have come to is ironically the 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 solution or the the insight that George Kennan has come to when it comes to the Soviet Union, when he wrote the long telegram and said, these people are only susceptible to the logic of force. I do believe that the Russians by now have come to the same conclusion when it comes to the Americans. And therefore, you know, the, um, uh, the only thing that could get them away from that would be actual um, actions following, following promises so that they would not need to go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, further to your point about the neoconservatives, obviously the neocons um, are not really in control. It's really the neoliberals, essentially, mm -hmm. the Atlanticists that, that lead the Biden administration. The neocons are their uh, loyal cheerleaders uh, on the Republican side. And of course, you know, uh, you know, Victoria Newland is uh, is a neocon. But, you know, I spoke to a, a, a fellow Russia expert last night and uh, I was I was amazed at what he said. He He basically said, you know, I told him. You know, wouldn't it be better to avoid a, a potential nuclear war, even a limited nuclear war with Russia, by uh, establishing a uh, you know Korean-style armistice agreement, just you know freezing the line of control? And he said no, because that would be giving into Russian blackmail. And and 
I said, I replied, uh, even if we save 275 million American lives, you know, you wouldn't still wouldn't want it. He's, and he's like, no, I'd rather die. I'd rather die, essentially die with honor, Harry Carey. I mean, he didn't say Harry Carey, but that's essentially what he was saying, is he would rather have the U.S. commit national suicide than have a peace deal that uh, ceded any Ukrainian territory to Russia. And, it, and it's it's this, ad, you know, we talked about this in our last, uh, last interview regarding uh, the mis mischances for peace in World War II. We're led by absolutist leaders. It's the absolutist mentality that refuses a peaceful compromise, even with an evil dictator. You know, Putin's an evil dictator. Sure he is. But, uh, I mean, he's not a genocidal maniac like Hitler or Stalin. But, uh, you know, he's a brutal dictator. But he's a, he's a, a dictator that actually is sincere about wanting peace. He viewed the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine as a, as a defensive prevent, preventive war. Now, do we accept that as uh, through Western, Western eyes? No, we don't accept that. We don't have to accept that. We just have to be realistic in terms of what we can, what's, you know, uh, they say politics is the art of the possible. Uh, it's the same with foreign policy. You know, diplomatically, we have to be realistic about what we can achieve. And if we continue to be absolutists, we're going to get it, get uh, ourselves into a, a third world war, and it's going to end very badly for the entire world, I think. Yes, to that. And um Let's uh, let's leave it at this because it, um, there's really nothing more to say at this point. But that we have to hope that these that these that the warmongering will will come down. Uh, thank you very much for alerting me to Ramaswamy and also to the to the things that are going on that are not as famous as, as Mr. Trump. Um, David Pine, I hope to talk to you soon again. Thank you, Pascal. It's a pleasure.